So um, here are the, uh, the notes and the assignment. You can grab those in a little bit, but let's just go over some announcement slides and then I want to show you one slide before I turn you back on to uh, this activity you're working on. All right, so the next assignment's due a week from today. Uh, you'll submit that as usual on MU Online. And uh, here are the sections of the book that we're going to be talking about in class today, the rainfall runoff model, NRCS rainfall runoff model, uh, 8.6 and 8.7. All right, so this course, what would you say is the big question that hydrology is uh, trying to answer? What, what is it? What to do with rain? Okay. So managing the runoff. Yeah, that's as good as answer as anything. Anybody else want to take a stab at, like, what's the big question of this course? Should I get flood insurance? Excellent. That's an important application, for sure. Other guesses? What does water do on Earth? All right. What does water do on Earth? Very good. All right. <coughs> so, in engineering, we, water, we, we narrow down our focus a little bit. You know, what does water do on Earth? We have to know a lot of the science to predict um, the runoff characteristics because it, it's specifically the runoff characteristics that are going to inform how big the culvert needs to be, how much flow is going through the channel, uh, what is the risk of flooding in an area. So it's these short-term storm events that are um, are of most application in engineering. And what I mean for an area of interest, that may be is a, a watershed or some upstream area or in a parking lot, for example. You know, how big should the inlet grate be for a new development that has tons of parking where they've changed the characteristics of the surface and now they're going to add a lot more runoff than there used to be. So some of the categories of information that we gather about an area of interest. We need to know a lot of information about the rainfall. So we want to know how much rain is there in a certain region. And so here in West Virginia, we're in something that's called the Type 2 region. And there's a typical storm pattern that's different from, say, the rainfall patterns in Seattle, where because they're right on the coast and they have sort of more like a slow all-day drizzle as compared to in the central United States there's the afternoon thunderstorm where it rains really intensely and very quickly. So that's what it means by the temporal distribution. Spatial distribution is you know how much the rain varies um, in one part of a watershed compared to another. We may have a storm that's so big that the entire watershed is receiving an equal amount of rainfall or you may have an enormous watershed like the Mississippi River Basin where it's very unlikely that there will be rain in all parts of the watershed at the same time. So we have to gather information and describe rainfall. So that's one category of information. Uh, another thing that we have to understand before we can predict this, before we can predict runoff, we have to understand all of the abstractions that may occur. Like, and we've been studying these things uh, class by class. You know, we had a class about rainfall. We had a class about uh, evaporation. We talked about some of the other abstractions that occur, uh, like interception by buildings and trees, the wetting of surfaces and small puddles. And then, you know, there are different models for predicting infiltration. You know, we can try and be more scientific and use green amped or we can be more empirical and take things easy and do the uh, Horton model for infiltration. Um, but in order to know how much water is going to run off, then you need to know how much of it infiltrated because we're doing a mass balance thing to try and say, you know, of the rainfall that occurred, how much of it is excess and how much is it going to uh, lead to runoff. So this is where we're he heading now. What we're going to be focusing on in today's class and next week is trying to understand the relationship between when you know how much there is of all these other things, how much runoff comes from that, and what is the shape of the hydrograph. Um, we can use a, a unit hydrograph to do it, and it, even if we don't have a unit hydrograph, remember there's the synthetic unit hydrograph that can be formed. 
And where we're headed beyond this, once we've already talked about runoff modeling, then we're going to be talking about how the, the routing causes delays in the timing of the arrival of water. So if water is traveling through a channel, it takes some time. For example, they've talked about what if um, the dam in California breaks. Um, you know, they've been talking about you know, the places that will be flooded and how long it will take that wave of water to travel down the river. And you know, it may take a couple of hours before it gets all the way to uh, the, the ocean for example. And that's what routing is, is looking at delays and more of the timing of runoff. And then finally, at the end of the semester, we're going to spend some time talking about um, floodplain management and risk assessment, should I buy flood insurance, for example. We're going to look at a website where you can figure up the cost of flood insurance based on where you live. And FEMA has done some pretty extensive mapping of the risk that you face in any given spot, because they know what the elevations are, and the proximity to water. We've already done hydraulic sizing. You know, when we were working with uh, HY8, and that was kind of assuming that you have a flow, how big, how big should the pipe be? So this is kind of like a map of some of the big questions that, well, the one big question and some of the categories of information that tie into it. Now, I don't want you to necessarily throw out how you've already organized your information, but I wanted to just give you this overview of the course in case there are a few ideas that you didn't quite know where to put yet, or in case that might inform some of your further uh, organizing. So let's do this. Take another uh, seven or eight minutes to finish up your conceptual model, and then we'll have each group explain the thinking behind their conceptual model to everyone and We'll see what you came up with. All right, uh, let's get these notes in your hot little hands here. Uh, notes, will you pass those back, please? And uh, the next homework assignment. Homework. All right. You know, actually, I think I'm going to take a picture of these so that I've got that in my notes for later. All right. All right, guys, so we've already seen uh, this slide. OK, so modeling. A model is a uh, representation of reality. You know, if we're talking about a model who's walking the runway with a new, like, style, they're supposedly like a representation of what the buyer of the new clothing would look like, an idealized representation, maybe. Um, in hydrology, what we want is watershed models because we have to do all this extrapolation of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, we can't go to a physical location and know with certainty what's going to happen in a rare extreme event because it's the marginal event. It's uh, the event that maybe it's only a certain way for a couple of hours in 100 years. But it's those couple of hours in 100 years that's going to maybe destroy a school or cause uh, someone's house to be washed downstream as it bursts into flames. So a model is a way, if we, if we have a computer simulation or maybe even just a conceptual model, a way of thinking about the inputs and the outputs, we can use it as a tool for prediction. And in our model, the, the, the model that we're going to use a lot this semester, the NRCS approach, it has some specific ways of accounting for the relationship between rainfall and runoff. And so the rainfall, what we mean by that is the timing of, you know, uh, how much precipitation there is and when. And then the runoff that we want to know is not just the volume of runoff, but the timing of it. 
because uh, you know a certain number of cubic meters of water coming down the river may not mean anything. It's uh, the intensity that that volume is conveyed that causes the damage. So if we were going to, in a picture, just kind of represent the before and the after in this NRCS approach, it uses a hydrograph which is a representation of the precipitation, and it's going to give us as an output the hydrograph. And all of the factors in between, like what the model is accounting for, is um, the characteristics of the watershed, like the soil properties. Here in West Virginia, we have a lot of clay soils, and that's something that contributes to the flooding that we have here, is the fact that the ground does not absorb as much water as areas that have sandy soils with a higher um, hydraulic conductivity. Land cover influences the relationship between rainfall and runoff. And by land cover, what we mean is just what's built on the surface of the land. So it can be if there's pavement or any other kind of disturbance to the original natural state, then that's going to increase the hydrograph as compared to the original hydrograph that was in a watershed before an area was urbanized and developed. The model should account for whatever abstractions we've got. The slope. And we've talked about the effect of these, these trends. You know, how a uh, steeper ground slope is going to speed up the movement over the surface. It's going to decrease the amount of water that infiltrates because the ponding depth will be lower. And our model has to somehow account for all of those general trends that we've discussed so far this semester. The stream characteristics like the sinuosity and how windy a channel is versus uh, how straight it is and maybe the effects of the slope in the channel. And then just the uh, geometry like the shape of the, uh, of the watershed itself. So there's a lot of physical properties that a model should account for. And if it leaves some of these things out, then we're not going to have as much accuracy in the runoff. And what we want it to be is as accurate as possible, because what are the consequences of inaccuracy in the model? Well, if the model is too conservative, meaning it's predicting a really high peak flow that doesn't actually come around, then you end up spending unnecessary money on infrastructure, oversizing culverts, making channels wider than they need to be to convey a certain flow. And that can be expensive. That money could have been used for other things. But if a model is underpredicting the runoff that you may see, then that's maybe even worse than overpredicting. Because if it's underpredicting, then the infrastructure is undersized, and then you have flooding, which can cause a, a loss of life and damage to property. So we want our models to be calibrated and accurate, and the underlying uh, theory behind the model to be as sophisticated as possible. So here's what the NRCS approach does. Is it uses the soil type and the land use to define something called the curve number. And the curve number is kind of like an enhanced C value. You remember that during the rational method, we had C values that just told us the proportion of runoff versus the proportion of uh, infiltration. So maybe if we had a, an asphalt surface, a C value of 0.9 would tell us 90% of the precipitation will run off. Well, a curve number is a little bit similar, but it's not a linear scale in the way that it's used. And the nice thing, the other nice thing about a curve number is it's a lot less arbitrary in generating. You know, usually with a C value for the rational method, we kind of just eyeball it. You know, we'll look at a grassy area and say, well, maybe a C value of 0.5. Um, but there's not as much science behind assigning a C value as you'd want to feel really comfortable and uh, so that it's defensible. You know, people maybe with C values in the rational method maybe would say, well, why not 0.6? And you'd say, well, I don't know, engineering judgment. Or, I mean, you wouldn't have any underlying data to prove it should be one way or another. But in the case of curve numbers and the NRCS approach, you can automate that. And you can take the uncertainty out of your hands and say the curve number is based on an actual um, uh, data file that shows land cover over time and you know what you know where there is forest where there's a uh, paved area and so on 
and it has actual soil type maps that are provided by the uh, USGS and so uh, it's more defensible. The other thing is that this NRCS approach is going to estimate the distribution of based on the curve number how much of the uh, the rainfall that comes turns up as satisfying the initial abstraction, how much of it is going to be retained by the soil, and how much will run off. The way it does it, though, is it just does it based on depths. And so you'll say a three-inch storm, how much of that three inches is going to go into each of those places. And then we have to use something else to turn uh, rainfall volumes or rainfall depths into uh, flow rates. And so the timing of it is important and we'll use a special unit hydrograph to turn amounts into flow rates and so to define the timing. That's what that last bullet point is talking about. Any questions? Okay, um, so here are some important definitions and you've seen this figure already today because it was on that, uh, that page of, of cutouts that I gave you. Um, this figure that we're looking at is a hydrograph. It's showing how much precipitation occurs at a certain time. And so the area under the curve is an amount because the y-axis is a rate. And so if you multiply a rate by a duration, then that turns into a depth. And so the, the units here for precipitation rate would maybe be centimeters, centimeters per hour or inches per hour. And then each one of these uh, blocks of time is a duration that we were measuring the rainfall intensity during that duration. Um, I'm measuring rainfall intensity right now in a watershed and um, I'm getting instantaneous rainfall intensities because anytime it rains there's a little sensor there that detects uh, one one hundredth of an inch. It'll tip the bucket and it will collect a data point saying when, that bu when the tip occurred. But here, the idea here is that we're averaging over a certain duration, maybe a 15-minute increment, the average intensity during that time. Okay, so you can see that the first thing, when there's rainfall, the first thing that has to be satisfied is the initial abstraction. And so that is like the, uh, the wetting of the surface, like the leaves and the forest litter. Uh, included in the initial abstraction is the interception of uh, rainfall by vegetation and buildings. So before there's any F sub A here, what we're talking about is the retention. So that would be getting down into the uh, soil. Before the water gets into the soil, it has to satisfy the initial abstraction. So this model is showing not only the relative amounts, but also the sequence of what gets satisfied. Anybody want to guess what this line is? Where have you seen that curve before? the shape of that curve. It starts off at a dashed line. What was somebody going to say? It was when we were talking about wedding fronts. And so, what is it? It's not runoff. Infiltration decreases, right. And so the phrase is the declining rate of infiltration. So. Infiltration rate is declining over time, as, as you wrote in your exam, because the pores are becoming saturated with water, the soil suction is decreasing, and so that's what this, this uh, curve is, is it's saying what's below that curve is the infiltrated water, and what's above that curve is the amount of water that's running off. And so it's showing that over time, you know, when the rainfall increases in this third time increment, even more of that is going to contribute to runoff because not only is the intensity higher, but compared to the last increment, now the, uh, the infiltration rate is lower. So it's the difference between the two. It's the difference between the infiltration rate and the precipitation rate that is going to cause runoff. Um, now this formula P equals PE, IA, and FA, that's saying if we do a mass balance on the water, the precipitation is satisfied by the abstractions, the infiltration, 
and the excess. And so here P sub E is meaning the uh, rainfall excess that actually contributes to runoff. Any questions about these ideas so far? This curve is very important. On the final exam, I'll have a couple of figures that I'll ask you to uh, tell me the story of this figure, you know, be able to explain it. And this is one that I've used in the past. I'll forget by the time I'm actually writing the exam. I, I won't remember that I told you this, but maybe this will be one of those pictures, maybe not. Um, even if I said it would definitely be, I'd probably forget between now and then. So, but, but the point is, I think it's uh, really important anytime you see a figure in the notes to be able to explain it. Um, now here's the relationship between the amounts. And um, S is calculated by the curve number. And I talked about how the curve number is influenced by two main things. The curve number is influenced by the soil type that you've got and the land use. And we have a table of soil type land use that will tell us curve numbers for different situations. But what that means is you can calculate the amount of water that is retained by a watershed. And retention is mainly water that's infiltrating into the soil. Um, if you know the storage depth based on curve number, the precipitation amount, and, uh, and, and by the same token, if you want to know the rainfall excess, we can rearrange that equation. Now we can make a couple of assumptions here. We can assume, for example, that uh, generally speaking, initial abstraction is about 20% of the uh, maximum retention. Uh, and that's a pretty common assumption that we'll, we'll use in an example here in just a moment when we want to calculate how much rainfall excess this is. Um, but what this represents is the, uh, the ratio of how much storage actually occurs to the amount that could potentially be uh, stored. Um, because the difference between the two is the, is the runoff. So again, Mass balance says that the rainfall that comes in has to come out or accumulate inside of a control volume. And our control volume is the watershed. And so the, uh, the watershed either is satisfying initial abstractions or retaining the water through infiltration. So in equals out as long as accumulation is zero. But if there is accumulation, then out will be less than in. And that's what we usually see. You only have the case of the rainfall depth equaling the runoff depth if you've had really saturated conditions. You know, at the end of a long week of rain, then maybe your runoff depth would be the same as the rainfall depth. But absent that um, antecedent moisture condition, then we have to try and predict the ratio between the two. Now here's the formula that we can use to calculate the storage depth based on a curve number. So I'll show you a table of curve numbers in a moment. Um, calculate the soil storage using this formula, and then you calculate the runoff depth uh, in this way. Uh, P sub E, remember, is the precipitation excess. And if your precipitation amount is not enough to satisfy the initial abstraction, then there's not going to be any runoff. And so the two scenarios are there's no runoff if your precipitation amount is less than 20% of the storage, because 20% of the storage is our guess of the initial abstraction. So just a sprinkling of rain. You know, if you have 1 one hundredth of an inch of rainfall, then that's just not even enough to cover the entire sidewalk with water. You'd see maybe some splatters, but you know, the splatters of water wouldn't be even touching. But once you get above a certain threshold, which we're saying is approximately 20% of the uh, maximum soil storage, then you'll start to see the runoff. And this is how we're going to calculate it. So just to get a feel for using that equation, let's consider this example. Let's say that we have some watershed where we know the curve number is 70. And we want to find out what happens when there's 0.7 inches of rainfall, and then what happens when there's 3.5 inches of rainfall. So what you should do is a first check is see, is the initial abstraction satisfied? And if it's not, 
satisfying with the amount of precipitation, then there's zero runoff. But if you do have the precipitation is more than 0.2 times S, then you can use this P sub E formula to find out the rainfall excess. Now, as a bullet point in Part B, I'm asking where is the water? And what I mean is break up the water into uh, the categories of how much of it is um, how much of it is stored, how much of it is uh, rainfall excess. Let me write those on the board. I want to know. Oh, I can't write on the board because I don't have a marker. How much P sub E? How much F sub A, which is the retention, and then how much initial abstraction is there? So those are the three categories that I want to know for where is the water. All right. In the case of that first storm, we won't see any runoff. There's no rainfall excess because the initial abstractions aren't satisfied. Um, the estimate is that 20% of the storage is uh, 0.857 inches. And so since the rainfall depth was just 0.7 inches, then there's not going to be any left over. So we didn't even finish wetting the surface, in other words. But in the case of a precipitation of 3.5 inches, then in that case, uh, the precipitation is larger than the initial abstraction, so there will be rainfall excess. And so we can use the, uh, the storage that we'd calculated. And what this S represents is the maximum storage that you could expect to see for this kind of land use soil type combination. Um, the, uh, the the P sub E formula, though, is saying that the, the runoff is going to account for about an inch. Um, so in this case, the precipitation was 3.5 inches, so not all of that precipitation goes into storage, even though given a long enough time period, you could maybe cram 4.286 inches of rain down underneath the soil. Um, in the short term, it doesn't end up being that case. And so if, if we're trying to figure out where is that 3.5 inches of water, you know, like how much of it goes into each of the three components, then um, this is where it goes. Um, 1.008 inches is rainfall excess. And we already knew the initial abstraction was 0.857 inches. And so the, uh, the retention, I could have just subtracted I you know, started off with 3.5, which is the precipitation amount. I could have said 3.5 minus 0.857 minus 1.008 and then get the 1.635. But rather than just doing that simple subtraction, I wanted to put it into this formula for retention to make sure that I got the same thing. And, and so what the retention is doing is it's saying, based on the ratio of the precipitation excess and the precipitation depth that there was, um, we'd expect 1.6 inches approximately to go into the uh, retention. So it all adds up. There is, uh, there's balance. But the NRCS method, it all depends on having an accurate guess of the curve number. And so when we're actually using that next software package, WMS, you're going to see actually how nice it is to have that out of your hands and so that it's not just engineering judgment or a guess um, going into the curve number, but rather the curve numbers are based on aerial photos of land use and based on good quality soil maps. Any questions on this example before we move on? No questions? All right. So you've used the NRCS method for the first time. 
very useful. Um, here's a summary of just the, the formulas. And uh, on the homework assignment that I've given you, um, I ask you to look at what's happening over time. And so, um, by the way, I think in the notes, the printed notes, it says homework 9. I actually meant homework 8. So change that. It's the homework I just gave you. So here's a hint on that homework assignment. Use this formula, and what we're trying to find out is up to a certain time, where is the water? And so how much precipitation has there been up to time t? Um, what is the, uh, the infiltration uh, amount up to a certain time? Now, the initial abstraction isn't going to change. It's not a function of time, and this, the s value isn't a function of time, but the, uh, the infiltration amount will be. So there's that hint for you on the homework assignment. Now, a little bit more about where these curve numbers come from. There are um, four categories of soil, according to the NRCS method. These are called hydrologic soil groups. And um, you can go onto the web, and the, the government has these really uh, nice quality maps all over the United States where they've They've done measurements of what the soil is, and then in some places they've kind of extrapolated based on you know, measurements. They'll sort of guess in between where it changes from one soil type to another. But the way that they have classified these soils into groups uh, is based mainly on their minimum infiltration rate. So this is the infiltration uh, rate when they already are saturated. And it's just gravity that's draining it, rather than the, uh, uh, the soil suction pressure drawing the water down from above. Now, what we have in West Virginia, if you look on a map of hydrologic soil group, is mostly group D and group C soils. And group D soils are um, clay or um, saline soils that uh, they swell up because of the characteristics of the soil. And you'll notice that here, Group D isn't even listed on the minimum infiltration rate because the minimum infiltration rate of a clay is basically zero. And it would just be the hydraulic, conductiv hydraulic conductivity. And for, in the case of clays, uh, it would be so low that it wouldn't really even be on the scale here. So you can't have a class C soil that includes uh, mixtures of soil that are high in clay content, but it wouldn't be a, a pure clay to be in group C. So up by my house where I live, um, if you dig a hole, then probably a third of it is clay, a third of it is rock, and then maybe a little bit of leftover soil. That's what I've, I've dug a lot of holes because I'm trying to put fruit trees into my yard. And you have to take like a pickaxe to break at the rock. And occasionally though, you'll get a patch of sand and count yourself lucky. So I have some group C areas by where I live. But here in West Virginia, it's very uncommon for us to see group A and group B soils because um, just because of the, the geology. And uh, it, if we were to measure, take soil samples and measure the infiltration rate, you could. Um, this isn't something you have to rely on the government to give you a, a soil group rating. You can, if you have a watershed of interest, go take 10 soil samples and do like a um, Remember, we talked about the double ring infiltrometer and just see how quickly the water is penetrating down into the soil. And if you keep filling it up, keep filling it up, find out as a minimum, when you've already loaded a bunch of water into there, how much water will it continue to absorb over time. And chances are it's not going to be group A soils, not around here. Now, once you know what classification you have for the soil group, Next, you go to a table of land use. And that's what's uh, shown here on the screen. This is taken from your textbook. And these land uses, you'll notice that there are columns corresponding to each of the hydrologic soil groups. And it's kind of interesting where some of the land uses, there is no change for the curve number. So look at the first thing that jumps out to me is paved parking lots, roofs, driveways. And so what it says is, even if you have sandy soil, your curve number should be a 98 if the land use is a paved parking lot. 
It's going to be a 98 for sandy soil or a 98 for clay soil. And the reason there is that the surface itself is completely impervious. And so it doesn't matter what's underneath it. But more commonly, unless you're talking about an impervious surface, then a class A soil is going to have a much lower curve number for a certain land use than a class D soil. So look at here, it's saying a good condition lawn, which it classifies as grass coverage is more than 75% of the area. So if you have good quality grass, then the, uh, the curve number is getting larger as the soil group gets worse. So what does a big curve number mean? If we go back to the equations, a big curve number, a big curve number is gonna lend itself to a uh, relatively smaller amount of storage, right? Because the, the bigger the curve number gets, then that's gonna make this first term smaller, and we're subtracting 10. But if we have a small curve number, like a sandy soil, then that means more of the water is gonna be getting down underground, and less of it is going to be excess meaning there's going to be less runoff. Some of the trends that we've talked about when we had, we had similar tables to this with uh, C values. And remember, we had differences in C values as a function of slope. And uh, sometimes you'll find that in, in tables like this, that there may be different curve numbers depending as a function of slope. Uh, in this particular table, I don't think that there is one, but um, let me ask you, why do you think for residential areas, here they have quarter acre lots and increasing lot size. And so if you live in a really fancy neighborhood where the lots are two acres in size, what they're saying is, let's say for uh, group C soils, you'd have a curve number of 77 compared to a bigger curve number of 83 for small lots. And so what's the effect there? Why do you have different curve numbers depending on the lot size? That's more building. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it's, it's the ra think of the ratio of impervious surface to green areas. If you've got a big lot, then probably your roof is some of that and the driveway is some of the lot, and maybe the walkway around the house. But a greater fraction of the lot is going to be green than if, if houses are really tightly packed. Like when you drive up here on 3rd Avenue in High Lawn, uh, some of those houses, I don't even know how you could walk. You'd have to turn sideways to walk in between them. There are some in Huntington that are so close together that I don't even think that uh, you could walk comfortably between it. And so when, when the lots are that small, it's almost all impervious area, and the curve number is going to be a lot higher. So that's the effect that it's trying to take into account here. You'll notice that, um, that dirt streets absorb more water than paved streets. And that's why sometimes um, you know, in parking lots or uh, in driveways, they try and put in pavers to try and increase the amount of water that can infiltrate and decrease the amount that runs off. Uh, there are also these land uses for different kinds of natural areas that haven't been disturbed by human activity. So uh, meadow versus forest. And then they also characterize poor versus fair versus good. And those are usually um, related to the percentage of the area that is vegetated versus just bare earth. So um, there are, just like I was saying, there are tables of, there are like maps of soil group. There are also maps of, uh, of land cover. And we'll look at some of those when we get into the WMS section of the course. Um, but how the soil behaves can be affected by whether it rained yesterday and whether it rained the day before that. And antecedent moisture condition or antecedent moisture class is a way of accounting for and making adjustments to a curve number depending on um, 
whether it was very dry or very um, wet in the past. And what these curve numbers are, these are curve numbers in category two, which is kind of like in the middle, assuming that it hasn't been unusually wet and it hasn't been unusually dry. But what these formulas allow you to do is these formulas allow you to um, take a type two, a category two curve number and adjust for if it has been really wet. So category three here is if it's been really wet. Like if there's been more than 1.1 inches of rain in the last five days, then you'd need to adjust your curve number to find out um, you know, how much extra runoff you're going to have. And if it's been really dry, then the soil is going to be more prone to absorbing uh, additional water than the typical type, the category two curve number would indicate. And so both of these are corrections that take into account if you've had really dry conditions in the last five days or really wet conditions in the last five days. And this is where sort of uh, it becomes a little tricky is, you know, till now I've been telling you how curve numbers are all scientific and it's based on, you know, actual solid data of land use and soil type. And you can measure this precipitation, but the tricky part is predicting in the future. So, I mean, like, are you assuming a worst case scenario when you design your culvert? You're going to assume that it's been very wet in the previous five days. Well, then the curve number that you use should be a group three um, curve number in order to account for the fact that not only do you have a certain land use and soil type, but then in, in the, uh, the days before the design storm, it's also been wet. So it's just kind of like a, another layer of conservatism if you go with a group three curve number. All right, so I'd like you to try out the uh, formula here for calculating the curve number and also how to adjust based on the antecedent moisture condition. Um, so let's say that we have a residential quarter acre lot on class B soil that we could look up from the table and uh, it would have a curve number of 75 under group two conditions. So find out what would be the uh, equivalent curve number if it had been no rain and what would be the equivalent run uh, curve number if it had rained for three inches in the last five days. You lost your Casio? It's an opportunity to buy a real calculator <laughs> for yourself an HP. All right. Now, this is, you may not appreciate yet because maybe we haven't used curve numbers very much, but uh, to go from the range here, from 56 to 87, is going to have huge consequences. If we put this into a watershed model and we're looking at the actual outflow hydrograph, uh, a curve number of 56 would lead to a, a runoff hydrograph that maybe is just super small, and 87 would be a huge peak. So when we get into watershed modeling, um, we'll do the same thing. We'll revisit the idea of antecedent moisture condition and try and compare what the hydrograph looks like. And so it's probably um, the most uh, mm, challenging thing in my experience of the NRCS method is dealing with predictions of the antecedent moisture condition. And um, it's where you have to be really cautious in not just using what comes out of this table as the only curve number that you'd ever see. because you know, the, the watershed conditions obviously change seasonally and they also change as the watershed becomes more urbanized, but then they can change on a day-to-day -day basis depending on how dry, how dry the soil is. Any questions about the main ideas behind the moisture classes? All right. Uh, another tricky thing is that 
in a watershed, you're not going to have just one soil type. And you're not going to just have one land use. It's going to be um, a lot of different land uses and a lot of different soil types. And so you have to come up with an area averaged curve number for the, uh, for the watershed. Um, so let's say that we had uh, land use where it's 40% in a soil group C that has a curve number of 83, 25% in soil group D that's going to have a curve number of 80, and uh, presumably the reason why that curve number is higher than the group C soil was is because of, I'm sorry, lower, is maybe the group C soil had some urbanized, uh, you know, some asphalt as part of that land use. Um, so just to illustrate what we do for an aerial average, rather than having you calculate that, um, you just take the percentage as a decimal, multiply it by each of the curve numbers, and then um, come up with the average of 86 based on that. And so if we wanted to know what's the rainfall excess for a rainfall of six inches, you would find the average curve number for the watershed and then put that average into the calculating for storage. And then we could find out the, uh, the rainfall excess uh, for the entire watershed. Now, the interesting thing to ask is, what if you put the curve numbers into the storage and the rainfall excess? And so you calculated the, the rainfall excess for each one of those sub areas. And, um, and you wouldn't get the same amount exactly. And uh, so where you define your watershed boundary is going to have an effect on the rainfall excess as well. And the guideline is that you should make your uh, watershed have as many boundaries as there's actually like a physical reason for breaking it up into pieces. Um, but sometimes the, the um, the land is directly connected to different segments. And so uh, take, for example, in this illustration, the picture on the left, it's showing that you have an outlet where all of the water is draining to, but you have a section where the area is pervious here, meaning that the water can penetrate down into the soil. And so it's flowing over an area that's impervious. And so this could be like a paved area or it's more heavily urbanized here. And so we've got grass and some of the water that's not infiltrating is going to be flowing over the concrete surface. Um, so this nomograph allows you to calculate the composite curve number um, by looking at the water flowing from the pervious area going over an impervious area. And so the way it works, since the overall area is 10 acres, then that means that 30% of it is impervious. So we could go here to the uh, 30%, and then the grass itself has a curve number of 60. So if we went up from the 30% line and intercept to the 60, and then to the left, then the overall composite curve number for the entire watershed would be about 72. Yeah. Like an, an aerial average? For, for this one, it would work fine. Um, but for this, for the, the next example we're going to have is what if the runoff goes from the asphalt and then goes over the grass? It's a little bit different in this case. And so uh, the nomograph would give you a different answer than an aerial average. And why would you guess? I mean, you've never seen this before, but you seem to already have the idea here. What, how are these two different? Because here is three acres impervious, seven acres pervious. That's right. And so put another way, the, the water from this three acres, it can, some of it may soak into the, into the grass. But in this example, the three acres of, uh, of impervious area is directly connected to the outlet. 
And so there's no opportunity for a portion of that to infiltrate down into the, uh, down into the soil. And so this nomograph is just kind of the same thing as an aerial average. We could have said 7 times 60 uh, plus 3 times 98 divided by 10, and we would have got 72. But in this case, it's trying to account for how much of the water that is not connected. So here it's called unconnected impervious area. How much of that rainfall that uh, is running off may now, when, it's, when the runoff is flowing as a sheet over the grassy area, may get down into the soil. And so here the nomograph's a little bit trickier to use. We have to first of all find the curve for the pervious curve number. So our pervious for grass is um, 60. And so we, here's our 60 curve. And then the next thing to do is to find out the ratio of the unconnected impervious to the total impervious. And so the unconnected is 100% of the impervious because this is now, some of it is directly connected and some of it is unconnected. But in this first example, 100% of the impervious area is not directly touching the outlet. So we'd use this 1.0 curve. And then on the bottom axis is the total impervious area, which in our case is 30%. So 30% of it is impervious. We go up to the 1.0 curve and then left until we intersect the uh, 60% and then down to find the composite curve number. So is that complicated enough for you? Again, Okay, so the decision points here are 100% of it is unconnected. So all of the impervious area is not touching the outlet. So that's why we're using the 1.0 curve. And then the total impervious area for this watershed is 30%. So we go up from the 30 and intersect this 100% curve. Then we go left until we hit the pervious curve number of 60 and then down until we get the composite curve number. So consider the difference. When it was directly connected, we said it would be 72 as the curve number. But now it's lower. Does that make sense with what we were talking about before? Like the, the actual physical effect that having the grass after the asphalt? Who can summarize why the curve number is lower? Right. And so the average curve number is lower because some more of the water infiltrates than had the opportunity to in this case. In this case, none of the water that's running off from the, the asphalt has any additional opportunity to infiltrate. It just goes straight to the outlet. One of the best management practices that we took a look at earlier when we had like picture after picture of things they do for stormwater, one of the things they do for stormwater is they'll put a grassy area next to a road, whether it's in a parking lot or uh, along a highway. Just having a strip of grass after an impervious area gives it some opportunity to infiltrate, even if eventually the water is going to go to an outlet. And another benefit of having a setup like this, where you have a, a strip of pervious area, is that if it's vegetated, that uh, generally that improves the quality of the water as well by filtering out um, uh, suspended solids before it gets to the outlet. Okay, so this was unconnected impervious, where all of it is uh, unconnected, but then some, some of it here is unconnected, and some of it is connected. <laughs> so this is a little bit tricky. In this, only 50% of the uh, impervious area is unconnected. So the difference in this illustration is that we would use this 0.5 line. Okay, so 30% of it is impervious. We'd go up along the 30% line, hit the 0.5 curve, and then start going over 
until we intersect the 60% and then down from there and in this case the uh, composite curve number would be 68 instead of 65 from the previous example. So we've run the gamut. You know, the two extremes were you could have a curve number of 72 if the impervious area is directly connected to the outlet or if it's all of the impervious area is away from the outlet, it may dip as low as 65, but then somewhere in between if you've got half and half, meaning half connected to the outlet and half of it unconnected. I really need to put a homework problem in that asks you to use this nomograph. I forgot to, but I'll uh, maybe make that change for next semester. Any questions? Can you say that again? Oh, right. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, what if you've got more than more than uh, thirty percent impervious area? Um, hmm. I guess. Um, yeah, why don't they why don't they extend that further? Like what would be the trend? Yeah. I, I guess maybe they just figure that there won't be that much infiltration into the grass if you've already got so much uh, impervious area, like you'd just be saturating the grass. I think you got it. Mm-hmm. So like if there was a segment connecting them? I think it would depend on the topography. You know, here we've been assuming maybe that the slope is a flat plane, but if there was a depression and if, you know, if you had a low point here like a ditch, then you probably wouldn't get the same effect for infiltration. Like we're assuming here in all of these that it was just, you know, everywhere flowing the, uh, the same amount, but if there's a preferential flow path that speeds up the flow of the water through that pervious area, then that's going to decrease the amount of infiltration you've got. And so, back to your question, you know, what if there's a strip of impervious area? Think, like, what if it was a concrete channel? You know, if, if you've got a concrete channel connecting these two, then there's not going to be any, any benefit and any reduction in uh, runoff amount. Great question. I'm glad you asked that because I, I forgot to explicitly mention the fact that we're assuming um, it's a flat plane. And is the ground ever a flat plane? Uh, maybe in a baseball field, right? <laughs> but, or a, a runway, an airport runway. But those are the only two examples I can think of. All right. Uh, that is it for tonight. So if we just revisit these announcements here. Your homework is due on Wednesday. We don't have a project in this class. So we're sailing through, right? And it's even light outside. We're quitting when it's light. I remember in the beginning of the semester, it'd be long since dark by now. So it's always nice to go home before dark. <laughs>